Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to today's lecture. With today's lecture, we will be starting a series on infections of the central nervous system. The topic of meningitis will be covered under these headings. Meningitis will be defined, types of meningitis described and their etiology mentioned. Clinical presentation of a patient with meningococcal meningitis will also be discussed. Its pathogenesis, laboratory diagnosis, management and prophylaxis will be enumerated. In brief, about two other common pathogens that is streptococcus pneumoniae and haemophilus influenza will be discussed as these are also common causative agents of meningitis. The first of these series we start with meningitis. What is meningitis? Meningitis is inflammation of the meninges that is the membrane covering the brain and spinal cord. Bacteria get entry into the subarachnoid space, multiply there and cause inflammation. So, it is a syndrome characterized by a combination of neck stiffness, headache, fever and altered mental state. There are various types of meningitis. Conventionally, they are divided into acute meningitis and chronic meningitis. Acute meningitis, the onset of the meningeal symptoms occurs over hours and up to several days. In chronic meningitis, it can be for 4 weeks and there are signs of inflammation in the cerebrospinal fluid. Meningitis can be caused by various microbes, bacteria, viruses, parasites and fungi. Acute bacterial meningitis is the most important syndrome which we are discussing today. The triad of organisms which commonly cause this are Neisseria meningitis, Haemophilus influenzae and Streptococcus pneumoniae. Occasionally, Streptococcus agalactia can be commonly seen in neonates or group B Streptococci as it is commonly called. Other gram positive bacteria can also cause infections. Listeria monocytogens is an important pathogen, Staphylococcus aureus and Enterococci. Gram negative bacteria are also known to cause infections, specifically hospital acquired infections. The major pathogens are Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Escherichia coli. Acinetobacter is the major hospital pathogen. Other bacteria which can cause meningitis are Leptospira, Tryponema, and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Leptospira and Tryponema normally present as aseptic meningitis. The etiology of meningitis differs in different ages. In neonates and infants, the common organisms are E. coli, group B streptococci or streptococcus agalacti and H. influenzae along with staphylococcus aureus. In adults, the three major pathogens are Neisseria meningitis, streptococcus pneumoniae and Escherichia coli. In the elderly, again the same organisms can be present along with staphylococcus aureus, other gram negative bacilli and listeria monocytogens. The viruses which cause it usually cause again a clinical presentation such as aseptic meningitis. By the word aseptic meningitis we mean CSF is relatively clear and no inflammatory cells are seen in the cerebrospinal fluid. The common viruses causing meningitis are enterovirus, paramyxoviruses, herpes viruses, adenoviruses and arboviruses. Fungi can cause a type of chronic meningitis which we will be discussing in a subsequent lecture. Cryptococcus neoformans, Candida albicans and Aspergillus are the major pathogens. Parasites can also come sometimes presenting as meningitis, Entamoeba hysteritica, Nigleria and Acanthamoeba, the free living amoeba and sometimes Toxoplasma gondii. Today we are discussing the story of a 60 year old man who presented to our hospital with complaints of fever for 2 days, headache, vomiting 4 times since morning, severe dizziness. On examination, the patient was fully conscious, clinically stable, his blood pressure was normal, pulse was 115 per minute and temperature was 38.1 degrees centigrade. On examination, a generalized maculopapular rash and a patch of purpura was seen on the dorsum of the right hand. Neck rigidity was present and the two classical signs of meningitis that is the Kernick sign and the Budurskinki signs were positive. No other abnormality or neurological examination was detected. Chest, cardiac and abdominal examination did not reveal any abnormality. He was admitted to the medical ward and ceftriaxone started empirically. 
provisional diagnosis based on the clinical findings was acute meningitis. The differential diagnosis kept in mind were encephalitis, brain abscess, cerebral neoplasms, subarachnoid hemorrhage, febrile seizures, delirium tremens and subdural empyema. A screening computerized tomography was done before a lumbar puncture was done essentially to determine the risk of herniation. This is done specially in patients who are more than 60 years immunocompromised that is HIV in patients with HIV infection, patients on immunosuppressive therapy or transplant patients, patients with a history of central nervous system disease, patients with a history of seizure within one week before presentation and any other neurological abnormality. Since this patient was 60 years old, a CT scan was performed on the patient. CT scan was normal, blood for hematology was sent, it showed neutrophilic leukocytosis, CSF was collected by lumbar puncture getting into the subarachnoid space between the L3 and L4 vertebras, 5 ml of CSF was collected, blood was also collected for culture and sensitivity and a scraping from the rash was collected for microscopy and culture. The CSF was transported at room temperature, only for virus isolation it must be transported on ice since bacterial infection was thought of, this particular CSF was transported to the laboratory on at room temperature. The CSF after lumbar tap was collected in 3 containers. The first container was sent for biochemistry and cytology, the second container was sent for microscopy and culture. In the first container, the CSF was seen to be turbid, there was increased pressure more than 180 millimeters of water, proteins were raised, glucose was lowered and the cells were increased more than 2000 cells per cubic millimeter which were predominantly polymorphs. Container 2 was sent for culture and sensitivity, the CSF in container 2 was centrifuged and the deposit was used for smear which was stained by gram stain and plated for culture. Container 2, the supernatant from this was used to detect antigens by using a rapid diagnostic test such as the latex agglutination test which can confirm a diagnosis of streptococcus pneumonia, H influenza or Neisseria meningitis on the CSF sample directly within a few minutes. Container 3 was kept in reserve for performing a polymerase chain reaction or a PCR to detect the molecular genes of the bacteria which could be infecting the CSF. So, the fastest report which was available was the latex agglutination test report or the rapid diagnostic test. The supernatant from the centrifuge deposit from container 2 was used for this and a, a latex agglutination kit was used. If the test was negative, it shows a homogeneous uh, opacity. In this particular patient, the test was positive. So, clumping was seen. So, this indicated a positive reaction. But with this test, you cannot differentiate between streptococcus pneumonia, H influenzae and Neisseria meningitis. It just shows that one of the three pathogens could be positive. Some of the kits also include streptococcus A galacti in this battery. The gram stain of the CSF was more indicative. It showed pus cells 5 to 10 per hyper field, gram negative cocci 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 microns in size which were arranged in pairs with adjacent size concave and flat. You can see many of them are predominantly intracellular. So, these are the gram negative cocci which were seen on the gram stain. The CSF was immediately plated on blood agar when it was brought to the laboratory and also plated on McConkey's agar. It was incubated aerobically for 18 hours. Then it was plated on a chocolate agar which was incubated in 5 percent carbon dioxide for 18 hours. The remaining deposit which was left after plating these and making the smear was enriched with brain heart infusion broth and kept for incubation so that if no growth was obtained on the original plates, thus enriched CSF could then be used for replating. Next morning on blood agar, small 1 millimeter translucent round convex bluish grey colonies were seen with a smooth glistening surface and entire edge. They showed a weak hemolysis on blood agar. These are some of the colonies which we saw the next morning on blood agar. On chocolate agar, small round colonies with the moist blue grey surface were seen and these are some of the colonies which were seen on chocolate agar. On McConkey's medium, no growth was obtained giving an indication that we are not dealing with a gram negative bacilli which would have grown on McConkey's agar. A smear was made from the colony stained with the gram stain, again gram negative coffee bean shaped diplococci were seen. There was a halo suggestive of a capsule around some of them. The colonies were then put for identification by performing biochemical tests. They were catalase negative. We have already seen how the catalase test is performed when we discussed staphylococci infections. Oxidase test was positive. Now, the oxidase reagent is a 
reagent which contains tetramethyl paraphenyl diamine dihydrochloride. Filter paper is dipped in this reagent and a little bit of the colony is streaked across the paper. If the colony organism is oxidase positive, you get a purple coloration on the medium on the filter paper indicating that the organism is oxidase positive. Now, carbohydrate utilization was also done for the colonies. The medium which was used for carbohydrate utilization contained cysteine triptychase and it was a solid medium. So, it is referred to as the CTA base and at a final concentration of 1 percent glucose, maltose, lactose and sucrose were added to it. The organism was glucose positive, maltose positive, lactose negative and sucrose negative. Since the indicator was phenol red, when acid was produced, the acid turned the medium into yellow in color. So, yellow color in the medium indicates acid production. After this, identification of serob groups can be done by serology. Now, based on biochemical composition of the capsular polysaccharide, Neisseria group has been divided into 12 groups A, B, C, H, I, K, L, W135, K, Y, Z and 29E. Now, out of these the ones which I have put in blue that is the A, B, C and the W135 are the more common groups which are commonly seen. This patient was infected with the sero group W135. K can also be further subdivided into 20 serotypes based on the outer membrane protein. These can also be identified by slide agglutination test by using respective antisera which was not done in this patient. Now, the container which had been kept for PCR a broad based primer was run with the 16S RNA gene and the amplified product was sequenced and matched with the database available on the net. So, the sample was PCR positive for Neisseria meningitis. So, the result was available immediately. Blood culture showed also growth of Neisseria meningitis from the rash culture no growth was obtained in this patient, but occasionally you can get uh, the growth of Neisseria in a patient of meningitis even from the rash. So, the final report from the laboratory was Neisseria meningitis isolated sensitive to ceftriaxone, cefotaxim, ciprofloxacillin, chloramphenicol and rifampicin. The patient was admitted to the medical ward and to prevent serious neurological morbidity and death prompt institution of antibiotic is essential. So, this patient was put on ceftriaxone empirically waiting a sensitivity report. Now, looking at the Neisseria meningitis which caused this particular infection, they are strict human parasites which usually colonize the nasopharynx. Asymptomatic carrier state is known. So, it is not that everybody who gets colonized with the Neisseria in the nose we should get meningitis. Transmission occurs by respiratory droplets or by close contact. It may cause a local inflammation in the nose also and average incubation period is 3 days though it can range from 2 to 10 days. From the nose once it has colonized the nose it can spread along the perineural sheath of the olfactory nerve through the cribriform plate directly to the subarachnoid space. So, this is one mode of transmission. The other mode of transmission could be via the bloodstream. They are internalized into phagocytic cells and along with the phagocytic cells where they avoid intracellular death the way they multiple they replicate and migrate to the meninges and thus cause inflammation of the meninges. So, spread from the nose could be via the contiguous spread along the nerve sheets to the brain or it could be via a bloodstream going to the brain. The clinical disease is meningitis which are suppurative lesions involving the meninges which cover the base of the brain, cortex and spinal cord. Case fatality with meningitis is high if left untreated. Sequelae in survivors could be blindness or deafness. So, it is important to recognize it soon and to treat it appropriately with antibiotics well in time so that to prevent sequelae in the survivors. Meningitis can also result in meningococcemia which will present with acute fever, chills, prostration and petechial rash. In this particular patient, the patient had meningococcemia because the rash was present and meningococci were isolated from the bloodstream. A common complication of this infection is waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome where you get fulminant meningococcemia presenting with shock, disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC, multi system failure especially adrenal insufficiency. What are the virulence factors of meningococci which make it so easily invade the brain? First and foremost they have a capsule which is usually polysaccharide in nature and it prevents the phagocytes from attacking the meningococci. Then they have pili which are adhesion factors which help it to adhere to the nasopharyngeal mucosa so that they do not get washed out easily with the secretions of the upper respiratory tract and from there they are able to adhere also to the meningeal tissue. The outer membrane protein gets inserted into the cell membrane of the target cells and induces apoptosis of the target cells. 
The lipopolysaccharide is the potent endotoxin. Okay, it is a gram negative bacteria. The cell wall contains lipopolysaccharide, so in, which gives the potent endotoxin and which is what results in the DIC which we see with meningococcemia. The IgA proteases cleave the IgA which is the local immunity which is present on the mucosal surfaces and thus protect the organism. Endemic meningococcal meningitis occurs worldwide and recurrent epidemics occur in sub-Saharan Africa. The type A and the W135 more common in developing countries. In 2002, there was a worldwide epidemic of W135 which started in Mecca. Our particular patient had recently been to Mecca and come back from there. So, even if there was not an outbreak in Mecca, isolated cases can still be possible year round. The type B type is more commonly seen in the more developed countries such as USA and UK. An average intra-epidemic nasal carriage of meningococci rate is about 5 to 10 percent. So, even when there is no outbreak of meningitis, about 5 to 10 percent of us carry the Neisseria meningitis in our nose. So, how do you prevent it from spreading? Now, this particular patient his household contacts were identified and they were given chemo prophylaxis. Chemo prophylaxis can be given either with rifampicin or ciprofloxacillin. Vaccines are available, elderly patients and infants can be given vaccine as a routine and specifically when they are going for large uh, gatherings like the Hajj pilgrimage, monovalent or quadrivalent vaccines are available. The quadrivalent vaccine consists of types A, C, W135 and Y. However, immunity is group specific and if in fact, patient can still be infected with one of the other 8 types of Neisseria meningitis which are there. So, with that we have completed the picture of Neisseria meningitis Now I told you they are the 3 big 3 which cause meningitis that is the Neisseria meningitis, the Haemophilus influenzae and the Streptococcus pneumoniae. So, let us just have a look at Haemophilus influenzae and how it would differ if there was a meningitis which was caused by Haemophilus influenza which was not detected in this particular patient. Now, Haemophilus influenza meningitis is more common in children less than 5 years of age. So, the very fact that our patient was more than 60 years of age, so made him a little less susceptible to meningitis by H influenzae. The incidence of H influenzae meningitis worldwide varies to about 30 per lakh population. The case fatality is even higher than Neisseria meningitis. Clinical presentation of patients with H influenzae meningitis, however, is similar to Neisseria meningitis except that it is more likely in children. So, that is the first suspicion you should have if you get a meningitis in children, the organism which you should first suspect is Haemophilus influenzae. Now, Haemophilus influenzae can cause invasive and non-invasive infections. So, it is though this prime, the prime target for meningitis, this, these inv invasive infections are usually seen in the capsulated strains which are the type B strains. Hmm. Apart from meningitis, you can cause other infections such as laryngoepiglottitis which is also referred to as crew bacteremia, conjunctivitis, pneumonia, arthritis, endocarditis and pericarditis. So, as a large spectrum of infections which it can present with as invasive H influenzae infections. There are some infections which are non-invasive which are generally secondary or super added infections usually of the respiratory tract in adults with strains which are not capsulated. So, the capsulated strains usually present with invasive infections the non-capsulated strains usually present with non-invasive infections. Since antisera is available to the capsulated strain only, the non-capsulated strains are often referred to as non-typable strains. So, as a secondary infection, it can cause sinusitis, otitis media, an exacerbation of chronic bronchitis or bronchiectasis. So, it is essentially the respiratory infections which are more common in the non-invasive H influenza infections, while the invasive infections are more critical and in more fat fatal. Now, similarly, once the baby comes into the ward, with symptoms of suspected meningitis, CSF is taken out, a CSF is centrifuged in the same three containers, a deposit of CSF is mixed thoroughly and used for gram stain and culture. The smear on the gram stain would now show 1 to 0.3 microns gram negative pleomorphic cocobacilli. So, they are very very tiny bacilli, so they are often referred to as cocobacilli. The CSF sometimes shows long filamentous forms. So, it is not always that they are tiny because it indicates the pleomorphic spectrum of the bacteria and they can be from tiny to very very long. So, these are some of the bacteria seen in the CSF of a patient with H influenza meningitis or these are all tiny and you can even appreciate a capsule around some of them. In sputum when you see it you usually see as clusters of cocobacilli strains isolated from acute infections as I told you earlier are usually the capsulated ones. Again 
H influenzae can also be detected directly on CSA by a latex agglutination test which can be used for detection of all three together or H influenza separately also. This test is of limited use in developed countries which influenza type B is not the common strain, but in most of the developing world the H influenza type B is the in strain which causes infection. So, the latex agglutination test can be a rapid detection test for diagnosing H influenza infection directly on CSF. So, appropriate antibiotics can be instituted because culture will take 3 days for you to get a sensitivity report. Haemophilus influenza is fastidious in its growth requirements. Just like human beings require vitamins, some bacteria also require vitamins and factor F and factor V are known as bacterial vitamins which are required by Haemophilus influenzae to grow. Factor X is essentially hemine and it is required by the bacteria for producing of its respiratory enzymes and carrying on with its respiratory activity. Factor V or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is a factor which is required for its metabolism which helps it in the oxidation reduction processes. So, unless these factors are available the bacteria will not grow. It of course, requires a temperature of 37 degrees centigrade and a CO2 incubator. If you see the medium at the top that is triptychase soya agar with factor X and factor V added to it and you will find tiny transparent colonies of Haemophilus influenza which have grown on it. The colony at the bottom is growth on chocolate agar which shows again tiny colonies on chocolate agar. Now, the organism grows on chocolate agar because essentially factor X and factor V are present inside RBCs and once the RBCs are lysed as occurs in chocolate agar, the organism is able to grow by utilizing this factor X and factor V from the lysed RBCs. Now, once you have an isolator of tiny colonies on chocolate agar, you can confirm that it is H influenza by checking for the requirement for factor X and factor V. So, this is a normal nutrient agar plate with two discs which have been kept on it. The disc contain factor X and factor V, v. one contains factor X and factor V. You will find that the growth is maximum between the two discs and not there away from the discs. So, this indicates that this particular organism is dependent on factor X and factor V for growth which makes it uh, suggestive of haemophilus influenzae. On blood agar also it can grow, but it requires something to release the uh, factor X and factor V from the blood. Some organisms also have the capacity to produce these uh, factors such as Staphylococcus aureus and some fungi. So, in this particular medium if you see Staphylococcus aureus has been streaked down the center and then haemophilus influenzae has been plated across it. Now, if you will see the growth of haemophilus influenzae is more luxuriant and abundant round growth of staphylococci than away from it. So, this phenomena is referred to as satellitism and this is because the staphylococci produce factors which are required for the growth of haemophilus. So, haemophilus will grow better in around the growth colonies of staphylococcus aureus. This can also be used for confirming an identification of haemophilus influenzae. Now, the colonies can be confirmed to be haemophilus by their biochemical reactions, they are catalase and oxidase positive, glucose and xylose is fermented, lactose, sucrose and mannitol is not fermented and nitrates are reduced to nitrites. Now, again they can be confirmed by slide agglutination test, 6 types are present A to F. So, A, B, C, D, E, F are present based on the capsular polysaccharide as we saw all invasive infections in specifically meningitis is caused by the B type or it is often referred to as HIB for short or haemophilus influenzae B type strains. The capsular polysaccharide and the capsular polyribitophosphate or PRP as it is referred to induces IgM, IgA and IgG which are bactericidal, opsonic and protective. There is also an outer membrane protein which is again gram negative and which helps in its pathogenicity and there is the presence of a lipo oligosaccharide which also is antigenic. The organism can be confirmed to be H influenzae by your PCR on directly on the CSF. The HPD gene encodes the protein D a highly conserved surface exposed lipoprotein that is present in all encapsulated and non encapsulated H influenzae. This gene is a target for development of H influenzae PCR which can be done either as a normal PCR or a real time PCR. The drug of choice for treatment of H influenzae is also cefotaxime or ceftazidim. Amoxicillin clavulinic acid or clarithromycin is generally preferred for respiratory infections because plasmid mediated resistance is being reported to ampicillin or cotrimoxazol. So, currently the drug of choice for respiratory infections thus becomes amoxicillin clavulinic acid or clarithromycin and the drug of choice for meningitis is cefotaxime or ceftazidime. Alternative drugs may be used if sensitivity is not present to the above two 
which could be chloramphenicols, hefepime, meropenem or the fluoroquinolones. Now, prophylaxis is available, vaccines are available against H influenzae, active immunization is done with the a hip PRP vaccine. In children, conjugate vaccines are preferred, immunogenicity can be improved by coupling them with diphtheria or tetanus toxoid or even the meningococcal outer membrane protein. This introduction of vaccination with HIV or the HIV vaccine in the routine immunization as children has decreased the incidence of meningitis in children. India in the last year has also introduced this in the routine immunization of all our children in making a pentavalent vaccine. So, that with that we finish the second important pathogen of meningitis that is Haemophilus influenzae. Now, Streptococcus pneumoniae you have studied in the past when we were discussing lobar pneumonias. Here, I am just re revising Streptococcus pneumoniae with you because it is one of the common pathogens we see in patients of meningitis. So, here the microscopic picture of the CSF would show pus cells again. Again, the CSF would be turbid, it would show pus cells, gram positive capsulated lanceolate or flame shaped cocci would be seen present with the capsule around them. So, these are the cap appearance that you would see two capsules, a flame shaped organism with a point at one end with a suspicion of a halo around them. Here the halo is quite clearly seen which would indicate that the organism is probably streptococcus pneumoniae. Sometimes small chains could also be seen. Rapid diagnostic test again for this could be used that is the latex agglutination or immunochromatography test which would be positive. For culture it would grow on normal blood agar and chocolate agar of course, it does not grow on McConkie's agar. On blood agar it gives you tiny colonies with the greenish zone of alpha hemolysis. If you let these colonies incubate for some time they form draftsman like colonies in the sense that there is an umbilicated zone in the center and the edges are raised. So, these are the draftsman like colonies which appear after prolonged incubation. Initially the colonies are tiny alpha hemolytic as you let them incubate you get these draftsman like colonies. To confirm the identity to differentiate it from other streptococci because it shows small chains the most common test which is done is the Quellung reaction. In the Quellung reaction a suspension of the organisms is mixed with a specific antisera and the capsule becomes well defined when you see it against a negative strain such as an India ink strain because there is a capsular swelling. So, in this picture on top you can see the pneumococci present with a nice large capsule around it. So, this is because of capsular swelling because of the specific antisera and this is known as the, known as the Quellung reaction. The organism can also be confirmed to be bile solubility if 10 percent sodium deoxycholate is added to a colony of pneumococci the colony will dissolve. Optogen sensitivity, optogen is a substance which can be present as a disc on a pa paper and put into the medium. You will find a clear zone around the optogen disc which would not be seen in streptococci. So, there is another alpha immunity streptococci which we have seen in the past that is the streptoviridans. The streptoviridans also will give you alpha hemolytic colonies, but it will not give you optogen sensitivity. Then it ferments inulin which also differentiates it from streptococcus viridans. So, the four important tests to differentiate streptococcus pneumonia from streptococcus viridans are the Quellung reaction or the capsular swelling phenomena, bile solubility, optogen sensitivity and inulin fermentation. It can also be identified by PCR directly on the CSF or on the colonies either by conventional or real time PCR. Genes targeted are the pneumolysin, the autolysin or the pneumococcal surface adhesins. Again a vaccine is available against pneumococci that is the conjugated 7 valent vaccine is now available for use in children. Antibiotic of choice is parenteral penicillin. However, resistance due to mutation or gene transfer has been reported now with streptococcus pneumonia. So, with the result in these cases a third generation cephalosporin or vancomycin can be used. So, it is very important to be able to isolate it and to do a sensitivity and then decide which is the drug you will use on this patient. Now, you have seen out of the three organisms we studied most of them are primary respiratory pathogens and from the respiratory tract they go to the meningeal surfaces and cause infection and resulting meningitis. Vaccines are available against all three of them out of which the haemophilus influenza vaccine has been introduced into routine immunization, meningococcal vaccine is only given in specific situations and now pneumococcal vaccine is also available for children or extremes of age. Now, we will just summarize the algorithm of any patient who comes to with meningitis what should be the follow up in the laboratory. The CSF is collected by a lumbar tap and it is collected in three containers. The first part of the tap is generally collected in a container for biochemistry and cell count as there may be a few RBCs in it because of the tapping. The second part is used for microscopy and culture 
and the third part is kept aside for PCR. Since PCR is a little expensive test, it is only performed if the culture is negative. PCR can be done with using broad based primers and these primers end product of amplification can then be amplified by sequencing and the sequence matched with the organism to identify the organism if no clue is obtained and the culture is negative. The middle of TSF is what is most important which is used for microscopy and culture because once you have an isolate in hand you can then do a antibiotic sensitivity and give targeted therapy. So, this middle container is then centrifuge, a deposit is used for microscopy and the supernatant is used for the latex agglutination test. So, this is the first test which can be performed that is a latex agglutination test often referred to as a rapid a test and this can be done immediately and within an hour the report can be available confirming that one, one of the three major pathogens are responsible for causing meningitis in this particular patient. The deposit can be used for microscopy and culture. The deposit is stained by gram and Zn. The gram will give you an idea of the appearance and morphology of the organism. The Zn will give you an indication if mycobacterium tuberculosis is there in the sample. The India ink preparation is usually used for cryptococcus neoformans, but can also show you the capsule of pneumococci. If capsule of pneumococci is appreciated and you add a drop of antisera and you get a capsular swelling, that is you get a quellung reaction positive, it indicates that you are dealing with pneumococci. The remaining part of the deposit is used for culture, it can be plated as such and if there is no growth the remaining part can be used for enrichment. However, if the sample is in very small quantities and you cannot collect it in three containers, we would recommend that you take the first part for biochemistry and cell count and the remaining part of it add brain heart infusion broth which can be used for enrichment and then microscopy and culture and PCR can be done on this. Now, once you plated it, plating media usually blood agar, meconchi which are incubated aerobically chocolate agar which is incubated in carbon dioxide and the isolates obtained are identified by biochemicals and agglutination or slide agglutination to confirm the organism. This diffusion test and MIC can be used for sensitivity, MIC is very important specifically for pneumococci where penicillin resistance is now being reported. Just overview of treatment of meningitis, this essentially you have to treat the shock or the hypotension by giving crystalloids, IV. Seizure precautions and treatment if necessary along with airway protection because if the patient may go into seizures and land up with respiratory problems. Prompt initiation of antibacterial therapy is the most important thing dependent on the patient's age and condition you can choose the antibiotic because in the earlier age the infection is more likely to be haemophilus and the later age it is more likely to be a pneumococci infection or a Neisseria meningitis infection. If patient is critical intrathecal antibiotics may be indicated. After identification of the pathogen and its susceptibility, then targeted antibiotic therapy can be given and the empirical therapy changed to appropriate for that particular pathogen. Steroid therapy may be indicated in some patients with lot of edema of the brain. So, these are some of the references for the images I have used for this particular presentation. Many of the images have been taken from the internet. So, I would like to thank all those people whose images I have used during this presentation. Some of the images have been provided to me by some of my colleagues from the Department of Microbiology BJ Government Medical College. So, I would like to thank them also. Thank you and have a good day.